question for married men. What hedges have you planted that show your wife you love her and that you want to protect your marriage? Or what hedges do you wish you had planted long ago? Today at the Radio Backyard Fence, kind of a surreal experience for me. I read a book some 30 plus years ago that made a big impression on me, and now it's been re-released and updated I focus on the family. Jerry B. Jenkins is standing by for a conversation, not about yard work, but about work on your eyes, heart, and hands as a man. Loving your wife and protecting your marriage by planting hedges. You're going to find out more straight ahead on Chris Fabry Live. Thanks for being here. Thanks to the team behind the glass today. Ryan McConaughey doing all things technical. Trisha is our producer. Peter will be answering your calls. But wait, there are more teammates, including you, friend. Those who support us with a gift are a vital part of this daily soiree. And for a couple more weeks, we have a fantastic thank you that comes from an author in Scotland. Landscape of Hope is something that Heather Holdsworth worked on during a really low point in her life. And she did it for her own heart. And here's another example of the tears of someone watering another's garden. This book is an illustrated journey into the Psalms. My prayer is that what Heather has done will not only help you get God's word from the page to your heart. I hope you'll do the same kind of thing with his word, maybe with calligraphy or photography or music or woodworking or whatever it is that God has gifted you to do. Let this be a catalyst to propel you toward this landscape of hope we find in the Psalms. Call or click through. I'd love to put this in your hands. 866-95-FABRY. Give a gift of any size, or you can become a monthly partner with us, become a back fence partner at chrisfabrylive.org, 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 or 866-953-2279. There is no one on the planet who has had a bigger influence on my writing than our guest today. And I used to joke that every time Jerry Jenkins released a book, I would have him on my program. And that's why he was on every two weeks or so. (laughs) The Left Behind series exploded in the 1990s and beyond. But before that, he said he was the most famous writer nobody knew because all of his books that he wrote then were written with and for others. There's sports biographies. He worked on the memoir of Dr. Billy Graham. I believe the book Hedges came out in 1989, and if that's true, it's 35 years ago. But the content of that book is needed now more than ever, I think. It's been updated and expanded. It's out now. Hedges, Seven Ways to Protect Your Wife and Protect Your Marriage. Jerry Jenkins, how are you doing today? Doing great, Chris. Always great to be with you. You know, I was just thinking about this. When you started the Left Behind series, the very first book, the very first line of the book is about hedges that Rayford Steele wasn't following, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, The first line was Rayford Steele's mind was on a woman he had never touched. And, um, uh, the unwritten line was, but he sure wanted to. <laughs> right. Yes. So even in that 747 that was uh, that was flying and all the people that disappeared from that, that was the catalyst of star. Well, that was part of the tension. And every man listening has lived in that tension. That's what you're writing about, right? Yeah, it really is. And, and I always make the point that I really come at this from uh, the standpoint of a layman. I'm not a counselor. I'm not ordained. uh, I'm not a professional. I'm a fellow struggler. And so I'm I'm simply saying, here are things that I've learned that have helped me and and hopefully will help others. It must have been a real kick, though, to have Dallas and Amanda, your son and daughter-in-law, write the foreword to this. Tell me about that. Yeah, it really was fun. Um, You know, I, I kept wanting to make sure that this updated and revised edition was new and fresh and and expanded. And I kept referring in the book to this new century. Um, And I I got a a note from one of the editors, a young woman who was probably born in the 90s, who said, is this still a new century? (laughs) (laughs) Well, to to me it is, but I guess to, to kids it's not. Um, but to get that that next generation, Dallas and Amanda, you know, coming 25 years behind me, 
uh, and, and realizing how they benefited from this and what they'd seen in our home and in our marriage. Um, and then, it, it, you know, be, because The Chosen is so popular, uh, it was just a shameless marketing thing to have their names on the book, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so I looked through the book again, you know, after, was, was it 1989? Is that when it came out? Yeah, that was the original one, yep. All right, 35 years. And this is this is the poll quote for me. Um, and it kind of states some of the things that you go into. But you, you write, love is not a feeling or even a state of being. Cold and unromantic as this may sound, I am not in love with my wife of more than half a century. Rather, I love her. Tell me why there's a difference between that you're not in love with Diana, you love her. Yeah, I think the, the, the difference there, and admittedly it's drawing a fine line, but there's that feeling of love that, you know, when you're in the throes of it, like puppy love as a teenager or when you're a newlywed, uh, nobody you'd rather think about, nobody you'd rather be with, no, you know, and, and so you're in love and you're feeling that love. But my contention is love is an act of the will. It's not a noun, it's a verb. And so now, 53 years into marriage, the first thing I think about when I get up in the morning is, how can I love Diana so that her day is the best day it can be? And if that's doing little things, if that's saying certain things, if that's touching her in a certain way, that's what I want to do. I want love to be an act of the will, not just some feeling that I've got. And you want others to get to 50 plus years as well. That's your, that's your hope. That's your vision. Yeah. And it's so rare today. It's funny when, when people get together and talk about how long they've been married, when we say we've been married 53 years, they say 53 years, how many marriages? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. So I got to open the phone lines today and ask you about this because there, there are some aspects of this that are a little, or have been, controversial like the Billy Graham rule that you write about, you talk about here. But I'd love to hear from you how hedges in your own marriage, how hedges have helped you, or you see this from a negative standpoint that I didn't have this in my life and I wish I had, and some of the fallout of that. So we'll take your calls, 877-548-3675. Jerry B. Jenkins republished Hedges, Seven Ways to Love Your Wife and Protect Your Marriage. We're going to talk about it today at The Back Fence. Go to the website, chrisfabrylive.org, and you can uh, click through today's information. You'll see a link right there, chrisfabrylive.org. More straight ahead on Moody Radio. Jerry Jenkins is with us today. Hedges, Seven Ways to Love Your Wife and Protect Your Marriage is our featured resource. And if you're a man, I hope you'll listen. If you're a woman, I hope you'll listen, single or married, because I think these principles apply across the board, but especially to men. So a bedrock question for you, Jerry. What are the hedges that you're talking about, and why do we need them? Well, um, one point I like to make, and, and you, you clarified it, that this is a book for men. I don't tr- pretend to write for women, but a lot of women have read it and and benefit from it, too, and learn a lot about men. But the hedges, my hedges may not be your hedges. My hedges reveal my weaknesses. And so, you know, the very first one, we, we referred to the, the Billy Graham rule, don't travel or dine or meet with a woman alone who's not related to you. Um, now, if, you, if it's a cousin or a sister-in-law or whatever, that's one thing. But if it's, if it's somebody who's not related to you, I say take care of how things look, and you'll take care of how they are. The, the reason I need this hedge, and uh, you know, for Billy Graham, it was, it was uh, reputation, et cetera. If anybody accused him of something, uh, he would have no defense if he was meeting alone with, with somebody. But this way he can say, there was always somebody else with me. I never met with a, a woman, an unrelated woman alone. Um, for me, that, you know, initially, especially 35 years ago, uh, I wasn't known. It wouldn't have, you know, I don't know 
what it would have done to my reputation if somebody had accused me of something rightly or wrongly. Um, but where I, where I saw weakness in myself was if I was attracted to someone, it wasn't, you know, a, a, a prostitute or, or some wanton woman. Uh, it would have been somebody that maybe I worked with and admired and hit it off with, and maybe we enjoyed the same kind of humor. And you, you get more and more familiar as you chat with this person. And I thought, if, if I'm never alone with them, that takes care of how things look. It also takes care of how things are, because if you're not alone with, with them, nothing can happen. Um, other hedges for me, uh, I like to be funny. Uh, I, I could be flirtatious, and I've seen couples do this. They, they'll flirt with each other, and it's and, and they often do it in public. So it's sort of, it's sort of so over the top. Everybody knows they're just kidding. Like, when are you going to dump this guy and run off with me? Type of thing. And and yet I've seen too where um, somebody does that and everybody laughs and nobody thinks anything about it until there's trouble in one of those marriages, and one of the people come to the other one and say, have you ever been serious about that when you talked about running off with me? Two marriages break up. They get married. That marriage doesn't last either because they rarely do. Um, my dad was a was a police chief, and he always said, uh, flirting is like looking down the barrel of a loaded gun. You might get what you ask for. And so that's one of my hedges. I, if I'm going to flirt, I'm going to flirt with my wife. I'm going to make her the object of my attention and and my humor, and as I say, anything flirtatious. So there's okay. a couple. I mean, there's you know. yeah. Let me let me go back to the Billy Graham because I, I understand and and you know when uh, Mike Pence was vice president, that way he was vilified for this, and then came the Me Too movement and you know this story and you and some people wished boy I wish they had followed the Billy Graham rule rather than what we're seeing here and how it played out but I also get the other side of that and and you've even heard some of that as well since hedges came out the first time you've had coworkers women coworkers who have said I don't know how to act around you do I, you know, is shaking your hand okay um so you've had to navigate that as well right yeah, and that happened too when, you know, like if I'm going to go speak somewhere and somebody calls me and says, uh, so-and-so is going to pick you up at the airport and bring you to the venue, and they'll, they'll mention a woman's name. And, and so it's embarrassing to have to say, well, look, it either needs to be a man or two women or a man and a woman, and they're like, really? And, and yeah, it, it's awkward and it, it's embarrassing, but I will trade that embarrassment for my 53 years of marriage any day. Um, and, and the fact, you know, you talked about the U2 movement. Um, there were people even in that movement who criticized Mike Pence for this view. And they're saying that it was discriminating against women, keeping them from certain opportunities in business and that type of thing. Really, it's an honor. Um, it, it protects their reputation, too. And uh, I, I think it's, it's worth pursuing. The thing that I heard most from women who were pushing back, Christian women who were pushing back against that, was – it makes us feel like we are predators or that you are and that you don't trust me. You don't trust me to be circumspect or, you know, to not have ulterior motives so that there is a suspicion about women that are, that's out there. And it's, I, I, I can understand how you could uh, interpret it that way. But I know you, that, that, that's not what you mean. You're trying to protect everybody involved, right? Yeah, and I've had women ask me flat out that, that very question: are, are you? Do you think that I have designs on you? And I'm, I just am proactive at that point and say, not at all. I don't want you to to think that. I don't want to insult you that way. Um, I, I think you're honorable, etc. Um, but I want to protect your reputation too. You know, if they're married, do they want somebody to say, "I saw your wife with Jerry Jenkins"? And they were alone. Um, you know, to me, I think it, it makes sense on both sides. But that's the time, I think, to just be flat out open and say, here's the reason for this. It has nothing to do with suspecting anyone. But I've also seen ministries destroyed by people that, you know, the the person, the man thought the woman was 
upstanding. She makes a pass. He rejects it. She goes and tells people he made the pass. Now, who's going to it's, – it's word against word. Um, but you're right. You can't, you can't paint everybody with the same brush, but it just pays to be careful. And there are stories that you give in here too, the vulnerable stories about yourself and you, know, your, uh, you and Diana. That was a really fun thing. There are things that you added in this, or maybe I just forgot that you put in the original, that were really open, really honest about how, you know, get down below the surface here about how you feel and how you look at life and try to protect your marriage. But there are stories, there are horror stories in here about uh, marriages that have gone south because of this very thing. Does one come to mind right now? Well, I I think um, one that that comes to mind is an evangelist friend of mine who, when he was very young, and he was pretty much a newlywed, he was preaching in revival services at a church, and a lot of the kids were attracted to him because he was young, and a lot of them came forward for salvation or for rededication or whatever. And um, he took them into the prayer room. There were about 15 kids, and he dealt with them individually. And he said, without thinking, he just he just realized he was down to the last one. The rest had left, and it was a young girl. And she made a pass at him. And he said, oh, no, you've misunderstood. I'm, you know, this is not, I'm married. This is not, not not what I'm trying to do here. She was humiliated, ran out, said that he'd made a pass at her. And so, of course, the meetings were shut down. The, the elders wanted to meet with him. And he said he would be happy to meet with them as, as long as he could face his accuser. So she came with her parents and they were all, you know, everybody angry. And and he, he just basically said, only you and I know what happened in that prayer room. And you need to tell the truth, because if you don't, my ministry is over. I mean, he was in his early 20s at the time, and uh, this this is probably 50 years ago. And and fortunately, she broke down and confessed that it, it had been the other way around. But that that could have ruined a ministry that, that became international. This guy's an international evangelist. Um, that that's the danger. Yeah. And even even more than that for the reputation is that union and the promise that you make, you know, to put you. This is one of the things that you say in the book. You continue to come back to this promise that you made a long time ago. You don't forget that, right? You know, that's the thing that I, I'm not sure what happens in wedding ceremonies. I mean, I know they've changed a little bit over the years, but there's still a lot of archaic language. And we walk down the aisle and there's the flowers and there's the rings and there's all the pomp and circumstance. And and then there's this sort of Elizabethan um, language where we say, keeping you only unto myself for as long as we both shall live. And it would be interesting, it would probably be crass, but sometimes it seems like that's just all part of the the process, and you kind of forget you've made a vow before God and man and your spouse that you will take no one unto yourself but them for as long as you both shall live. And wouldn't it be interesting if the officiant, whoever's doing the wedding, would say, let's rehearse this now. You said that. What you've just said is you're not going to sleep with anybody else as long as you both shall live. Now, people would kind of laugh or titter or whatever, but that's the truth. When when I wrote Hedges the first time, I, I had people coming to me, and they wanted to be counseled. And I would tell them, I'm not a counselor. I'm a fellow struggler. I have these hedges to protect myself and my marriage, etc." And they would say things like, well, my question is, should I tell my wife about this affair I'm having? Or should I, you know, and, and I said, let's let's start at the beginning. It, one thing you have to acknowledge, and so many people would say, this new relationship is so great, God has to be in it, which is just blasphemy. I would move away from them and say, I'm going to sit over here because I'm not I, I'm not fond of lightning. You know, you're talking about something that's so opposed to Scripture. The first thing you need to do is acknowledge that you broke your vow. You promised this is something you would never do, and you've done it. So start there. Take responsibility. And then maybe healing can can be in. Yeah. 
And you've seen that. There have been, uh, through the years, those stories of those uh, couples and hedges that have been replanted or planted for the first time. It's in the book, uh, the re-release of Hedges, Seven Ways to Love Your Wife and Protect Your Marriage. Jerry Jenkins is joining us today at the Back Fence. I want to go to Jan's call in Florida. Jan, tell me why you called today. Hi, Jerry. Hi, Chris. (laughs) I just wanted to let you know that when my roommate was sick and we were in the hospital at different times, we would give copies of five love languages and hedges to the people that were working with us. Mm -hmm. It didn't make any difference what religion they were, what everybody wants a strong relationship. And we Mm -hmm. found them great tools for starting conversations and building relationships with the caregivers. Isn't that great? So that this transcends yeah. the, you know, the religious, social, cultural uh, boundaries there. What do you think, Jerry? Yeah, that's great to hear, Jan. And I can't tell you how many times over the years I've heard this, that people pass hedges around. I mean, uh, of course, you mentioned that, you know, left behind sold tens of millions and all that. Uh, hedges is not in that category of sales, but it, it, it tends to have that kind of loyalty of readers, people pass this around and, and I do I do love what she said about um, whether they're you know necessarily evangelicals or Christians or anything uh, people want a, a strong relationship I find that people that uh, that I know that are not not fellow believers they hear about this book and they want a copy of it they want to know how to strengthen their marriage right Jan thank you for your call today here's the number eight seven seven five four eight three six seven five if If you read this book a long time ago and it planted a hedge for you and you want to tell other folks about what has happened, or maybe it's the mistake that you made that you want to warn others about. It was something that happened at work. I've heard about stories of, you know, we sang in the choir together and uh, and something started then, the little spark started then. Or the Facebook romance, you know, the person from high school that you you were enamored with way back when and then... You know what I'm talking about. 877-548-3675. One of the things that you talk about in the book that you've heard, though, time and time again, Jerry, is the the statement from men who have to tell their kids why they're getting a divorce. And one of the things they say is, I never really loved my wife as if that makes it OK to leave and get divorced. Talk about that. Yeah, and usually that's a lie, because if people think back to when they get married and you look at the pictures, you can tell these people are in love with each other and do love each other. But they have to, you know, when you set aside your whole system of values, you have to change the foundation somehow to make it justified in your mind. And uh, if you only knew what my wife was really like, or if you only knew that I never really loved her, I thought I did, but uh, then there's this new person. Uh, And and kids, you know, this is another lie from the pit. People will say, better for a couple to get divorced than to live in disharmony um, just for the sake of the kids. Kids are resilient. Kids will get over it. Kids don't get over it. I talk to adults all the time who are victims of divorce when, when they were kids. They still wish their parents would get back together. They may have been married several times since then, and maybe they don't even talk to each other anymore. And the kid is still saying, and the, the adult now is still saying, I just wish my family would come back together. That, it rocks the kids. It creates chaos. Yeah. Well, you even, well, you were 12 years old when something happened in your church, right? Yeah, and that really stunned me. I can remember, you know, I was I was the third of four boys, and so I was one of the younger ones, and, and I knew something was going on at church, and I kept asking my mother, what's going on? because the the pastor seemed to be in trouble and there were meetings and there were private conversations. And, and, uh, you know, I finally realized that people were accusing him of something um, that was threatening his marriage. And, you know, being 12 years old, I'm thinking, uh, not, not our pastor, there's no way. And I said, well, tell me, what, what did he do? And she said, you don't want to know. And I, of course, as a kid, I'm bugging and, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I can handle it. I can handle it. And I finally talked to her to tell me. And I wish I hadn't. I mean, I remember it to this day. 
Um, the church was split over this. Uh, the pastor had, you know, taken up with somebody who wasn't his wife. It was somebody who sang in the in the church as solos and lived near him. And uh, I'm telling you, it it, it just it makes you wonder who you can trust yes. and and why there wouldn't have been, you know, I mean, I wasn't thinking about hedges at that time, but why not? Why not rules in place that would protect him from this? 877-548-3675. Tell me about the hedges that you've planted. We're going to go through the other hedges that we haven't talked about so far. Seven ways to love your wife and protect your marriage. The book Hedges is our featured resource at chrisfabrylive.org. Talk with Jerry, 877-548-3675. This is Chris Fabry Live. Jerry Jenkins joining us today. We're planting hedges of the heart to show love and protection for your marriage. I want to mention Rollin Warren's story here. He is now president and CEO of CareNet which does great pro-abundant life work around the country. He wrote about the hedge that he wished he had with his girlfriend when they were both studying at Princeton. One day she called him and said, I'm pregnant. And what happened with that unborn child and the situation they found themselves in is a story of freedom and redemption and God's grace and mercy in the midst of an unplanned pregnancy. The book that uh, Roland has written is called the Alternative to Abortion, Why We Must Be Pro-Abundant Life. And it's a personal story that shows, again, that the mistake, the wound, the struggle can lead you to a place of healing that benefits others when you are vulnerable with that story. Click the green CareNet button at chrisfabrylive.org. You'll find out more about The Alternative to Abortion, that book by Roland Warren, If you're going through an unplanned pregnancy right now, there is help and hope through CareNet. Go to chrisfabrylive.org, click that green CareNet button or link at chrisfabrylive.org. Jerry, that's one of the issues that you and I both care a lot about, speaking up for those who don't have a voice, right? That's true. And, you know, living here in Colorado, there's this big push going to, you know, get get the decision about abortion back in the hands of the state here. And and uh, we see women on commercials all the time talking about uh, it's my body and my choice and, and uh, you know, nobody else should make the decision for me. And I'm thinking, what about the unborn woman who is speaking for her, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And that's where it comes down. And, and that's where I love what Rollin writes about because it's not um, – his his idea is to move back from politics, downstream from whatever's going on politically or with legal issues, the Supreme Court, et cetera, et cetera. All those are important. But he says, we're going to move back toward the heart. We're going to move back toward the woman who is finding herself in this situation and feels like there's no path forward other than abortion. And part of Rollins' story is— he was there and he said, no, you, no, you're not going to have an abortion and, and we're going to get married and we're going to raise this child. So when a woman sees that she has real choices and there's somebody there who will walk alongside her, many times she will make a different decision than to go toward abortion. Not every woman, but many will. And I think that's part, that's what ties this into hedges and what you're talking about, that if you deal with what is really going on in your heart that is, you know, uh, leading toward flirtation, or we haven't even talked about pornography and how uh, it proliferates our culture and seeps into our culture. You can have a very chaste life as a husband as far as not touching or looking at another woman, a physical woman, but be uh, addicted to pornography, right? Yeah, in fact, I just talked to a friend the other day who said that he he didn't feel like he was addicted, but that he had times when he would go out and, you know, buy a movie or buy a magazine or something like that. And then that constant cycle of shame, you know, I'll never do this again. And then, you know, months later, it it would start up again. And it's poison. He says, there are things that I have in my mind that I can't get out of my mind. 
and uh, it just makes the hedges all that more important. Yeah. And if you go to the website, click through today's information, you'll find out more about it. For any man, and especially the, the women too, there's a study that is included in here as well. I think it'd be really helpful. Maybe you go through it together as a husband and wife. Jeannie is in Idaho. Jeannie, why did you call today? Our, my husband and I were married for 30 years, and he had hidden infidelity. Um, we went to marriage counseling, and after describing what I was experiencing to the counselor, he looked at my husband and asked him to, to tell him about his infidelity. My husband denied it. We ended up divorcing. Um, during that time, he turned to God on his own, confessed his sin to me, and the children began rebuilding trust. And we've now been remarried for two years. And we went through a program called Pure Desire. Org, puredesire.org. It's a ministry to help men who struggle with pornography. How long between then you were divorced, married for 30 years, you were divorced, and now you're remarried. How long of a time in between was that? Was it like two years, three years? Seven. Seven years. Seven years, and you didn't go and get remarried. You didn't go looking for somebody else, et cetera, et cetera, right? I was experiencing betrayal trauma. Hmm. Sin affects everybody in our lives, even when we don't confess it. For the man who wonders if he should confess his infidelity to his wife, he needs to know that the Bible teaches everybody's affected by your sin anyway. It's only after we confess our sin, God says after repentance comes joy, then we're able to begin to build trust. And that's when the shame is removed from yourself and those you've sinned against. Yes. What do you say about that, Jerry? That's an amazing story, and it's also, unfortunately, quite rare. So many times that this, you know, this ends in in disaster. Um, but the fact that he, you know, came to a point of repentance and confession to his family and to her that that's just amazing, and that shows the forgiving and reconciling power of God. Yeah, and it also shows the long suffering love, you know, to to wait and to hang in there because you, she didn't know what was going to happen with him. She didn't know that if he was going to turn around or repent, if God was going to grab hold of his heart or not. Uh, and she was going through that trauma as well. And, and your heart goes out to anybody who's in that, that kind of situation. Uh, but, uh, but there's hope. There's also other stories that you tell in the book, Jerry, of reconciliation, but there's not one that doesn't at some point, like Jeannie was saying, that at some point isn't on, it doesn't get honest about, well, here's what actually happened. You have to be honest, right? Yeah, and so often what people do is they confess only to what they've been caught at, mm. you know, and, um, and they're, so they'll confess to, to lesser sins or things they shouldn't have done. And then it comes out more and more. We, unfortunately, we see this in, in church leadership where somebody, you know, an affair comes to light and a pastor is asked to step down. And then all of a sudden, dozens of stories come out that all relate to the same person. Um, I don't. I guess that just, just shows the, the deceitfulness of the human heart. Um, but, yeah, it, it takes uh, total transparency. And as we say, confession and repentance to, to, to turn things around. I think one of the things, and, and Jeannie, thank you. Uh, tell your husband, uh, thank you. Thank you for that story and for his turnaround and his ability to be honest with you as well as, uh, as the kids and others. Um, but if, if this is, if life is about our happiness and our fulfillment, if that's what it's all about, and love is about you being happy, you know, and you're going to uh, stay in the marriage as long as you both shall love, then it makes sense that people would run for whatever they think will 
make them happy or make them fulfilled. So they're almost, I think what you're doing with this book and the re-release of it, and it's expanded and updated, I think what you're doing is you're speaking to a new generation of men and women, but especially men, that life is not about your happiness. Life is not about your fulfillment when you commit yourself to that other person. Talk about that. Yeah, in fact, when I talked about how the first thing I do every morning is try to determine what will make Diana um, give her a great day and show her my love for her, um, I'm not I'm not pursuing my own happiness there. Uh, I don't I don't think I see in the Bible some promise of happiness. But can you imagine how happy I am when she's happy? And yes. so there's a double benefit. Um, you know, virtue is its own reward. Doing the right thing is, is a great thing. It makes you feel better about yourself. But nothing makes me happier than her smile and her sense of well-being. So you, you, can, you can get happy through this, but that shouldn't be your main goal. Right. It's a byproduct, and the joy is a byproduct rather than the goal of it. And so that's one of the things that I took away from a rereading of Hedges, Seven Ways to Protect Your Wife and Protect Your, sorry, Love Your Wife and Protect Your Marriage. If you go to chrisfabrylive.org, you'll see that featured resource right there. Click through today's information, and you'll see the book by Jerry Jenkins, uh, chrisfabrylive.org. There's more coming up with Jerry straight ahead, and I really want to talk about mostly about the heart. How do we get the heart and not just have this be about our hands or our eyes? We'll talk about that straight ahead. This is Chris Fabry Live. We're talking about Hedges, Seven Ways to Love Your Wife and Protect Your Marriage. We've gone through a couple of these and have mentioned them throughout, but I want to to board down on a couple of them. The whenever I need to meet or dine or travel with an unrelated woman, I make it a trio. You know, I don't. I'm not alone, especially when traveling. I am careful about touching. Jerry says, although I might shake hands or squeeze an arm or shoulder in greeting, I embrace only dear friends or relatives and only in front of others. If I pay a woman a compliment. It is on clothes or hairstyle, not on the person herself. Commenting on a pretty outfit is much different, in my opinion, from telling a woman that she herself looks pretty. Uh, parse that for me. Why is that important? Yeah, that seems like I'm, I'm drawing a really fine line there. And I, and I want to emphasize again, my hedges are not necessarily your hedges. Some guys look at that and go, that's not an issue. But again, I was talking to a friend just the other day, and he said he was tempted to tell a coworker, "Wow, you look great today." And he said he he checked the hedges, and and he said <laughs> that that outfit really looks nice on you. And there's there's a fine line difference there. For me, I need that hedge because I can get kind of a thrill if that compliment is is too personal. If I say, "Wow, you look great." Um, that gives me a thrill that I, I shouldn't have, that I should save those kind of compliments and that kind of familiarity for my wife. Uh, again, if that's not your issue, don't plant a hedge there. Uh, there are places where other men have to plant hedges where I don't. Um, so that that's, that's the key to that one. Does that make you then, uh, in a work situation or small group or whatever, does that create distance between you and another person, uh, another, a female, uh, where it wouldn't, if you were just talking with a, a guy and you're fishing together, or going to a ball game together, you'd talk about whatever you want to talk about and never think a thing about it. Now, if it were, but, but, but add that male, female thing there does it create distance between you and the and the woman uh, to not be able to to talk about things that you you know you could share as brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, I think it it it, it offers distance that needs to be there. Now, it, it shouldn't keep you from talking about spiritual things or um, you know normal everyday things. 
But when you get too familiar and too personal, um, I think that's where where the danger can come in. And uh, so I, I try to be open with people um, and and talk you know talk about anything you want to talk about. Just don't make it so familiar and uh, and so personal. Um, I've I've had um, times when some you know woman might compliment me. Mm-hmm. on something and and I'm I'm sure she's not intending anything untoward but my initial response is always thank you my wife thinks so like if they say oh you're so funny or you're you know whatever you're you're, you're so kind I'll say I'll say thanks my wife thinks so too and that just says you know I've got boundaries and I've got you know and, and I don't think it, it it insults them for me to say that right Okay, the other thing you said here, and you, you write about it in the book, is take care of how things look, and you'll take care of how they are. But that's not true of the heart. If a, if a man is, you can get all the filters on your phone and computer, you can, you can follow all these rules, never be, never be. But still, if the heart is bent toward uh, immorality, it will come out. So I, I guess that my question after going through this again is how do I how do I deal with the heart thing that you can't deal with with just simply a set of rules? Does that does that make sense? It does. And and to me the answer there is is true accountability. I have an accountability team, um, three guys that I, that I know and trust. And we connect every month by Zoom or by phone, uh, sometimes even in person. And I want them to ask me the hard questions. I want them to hold me accountable. And we're honest with each other. And we want to, you know, um, if if because like you say, if you take care of how it looks, people may not realize that you're secretly looking at porn on your phone or on you know somewhere else. Um, but if you have an accountability group. And and you're telling the truth. That's going to going to keep you from doing that. You know, we lo- love to say. I, I can remember back in my day, um, adult theaters were the thing. You don't need those anymore because everything's on, on the computer right. now. But uh, uh, I think for a lot of men, sometimes the reason they wouldn't go to an adult theater is that they were scared to death of being seen. And I ha- I've had some say to me, and, and I, I can identify with this. I wish I didn't go because I was above it and, yes. and too spiritual, and that I was prayed up, and that and that God was telling me I could flee that, and I wasn't fleeing. But the fact is, sometimes when you're weak, the only thing keeping you from that is the the potential embarrassment and shame of being caught. Well, use whatever is necessary at the time. But I would add a, a hedge of accountability to to all these, and if you can. Be truly accountable to somebody that that will force you to tell the truth. That's going to go a long way. Which is exactly what Larry is talking about in uh, Florida. Larry, go right ahead. What were you going to say? Thank you, Chris and Jerry. Uh, I've been married fifty six years, saved seventy years ago. We we are blessed, truly blessed of the Lord. We sing hymns on the back porch. It keeps us together. I love serving my wife for years of the food and cleaning up. But the main thing. The two uh, purity groups I went through a couple of years ago, they were identical. Same book. Every man's battle is important. Some pastors are afraid to touch this, but it's so important. And Jerry is right on target about accountability. And just small men's group years ago was in one for five years with four of us, praying for each other, going through the Bible. Even Chris said, thank you for your police work, but it was a cell group, but it was a small group, not a police group, not a jail group. So uh, I would just endorse the... uh, Instigation, it's harder with time short shortages to have small men's groups of three to four persons, if you can, morning or night, have accountability. And, uh, you know, dating a long time, uh, devoted to your wife in a strong way. We sang together in choirs. That was our commonality. But the main thing is just um, love your wife. Know that she's the one God created for you. And stay in the scripture that reinforces, you know, the wife of your youth. In the yeah. Bible, Jerry, the wife of your youth. Yeah, love her. 
I like that, Larry. And and you mentioned time because that's one of the other things that you do. Mainly, you talked about it, Jerry, for your your kids. You know, spend time for your kids, but you've you spend time as well for your wife. You don't be and you wrote a lot of books during all these years, but you found time for her, Diana, and your family, right? Yeah, and boy, Larry could have written this book, couldn't he? He, he sounds <laughs> like he's right on the same page. Um, but yeah, we should always continue to court and date our spouse. Um, you know, don't don't take for granted, well, we're married, she knows I love her, uh, we've been living together all this time, so she knows. I want to treat her like she's somebody special, and so we, you know, we're dating frequently during the week, and uh, keep that up. The book is Hedges, Seven Ways to Love Your Wife and Protect Your Marriage, forwarded by Dallas and Amanda Jenkins, Jerry V. Jenkins, Great to get to talk with you today, friend. Thanks a lot for uh, spending some time here at the Back Fence. My pleasure. Always great to be with you, Chris. Appreciate it. Here is the website where you can find out more. Click through today's information at chrisfabrylive.org. If you've never read this book, well, you've never read this updated, I can guarantee you that uh, because it just came out this month. It's titled Hedges, Seven Ways to Love Your Wife and Protect Your Marriage. Go to chrisfabrylive.org. Now we've got a Friday in front of us tomorrow, and I want it just you and me, just you and me, and some stories about the kindness of people who have come along. Maybe during the storm you experienced this, or you were able to reach out to somebody else. I have a story about a drive through restaurant and kindness that was shown to someone, and a whole lot more. We're going to talk about those kindness stories. Can we have kindness even in an election year? Let's talk about it on Chris Fabry Live, a production of Moody Radio, a ministry of Moody Bible Institute. Thanks for listening.